Hello, everyone. Welcome. Take a seat. We're going to wait a minute or two for everyone to trickle in. So we're not going to start right away this second. And uh, feel free to say hi in the chat. You can choose whether you can you send a message to us as the panelists, or you can also choose to send a message to uh, the panelists and the attendees. So take your time finding the way around. And we will start in about a minute or so. I think if we start, there's people still entering, but yeah. Yeah, I think we can start, should be okay. Okay, welcome everyone to, to uh, our webinar on uh, running an online conference in Strides from LAC20. So this is a webinar organized by the Society for Learning Analytics Research, and we're gonna mention that a bit uh, more in, in just a bit. So let me just share my screen. You should be able to see it. You see the slide now? Yes. Excellent. So my name is Vitamir Kovanovic. I'm a research fellow from the University of South Australia. And together uh, today, I'm here with Marin Schaefel from Open University in Netherlands. And two of us will uh, show, uh, we'll give a talk on our experience in running an online conference, uh, in particular Learning Analytics uh, 2020. So a bit about us. So I'm a research fellow at, at uh, Education Futures at the University of South Australia. I'm active in learning analytics research, uh, educational technology and online and education research. I'm also secretary of the Society for Learning Analytics Research. And this year I was a program co-chair for LAC20 conference. And uh, I'm Marin Scheffel. Uh, as Vita said, I'm from the Open University in the Netherlands, and there I work at the Faculty of Educational Science, and I'm an assistant professor there. Um, I'm also mainly active in learning analytics, um, technology enhanced learning as well, and also online learning, um, especially seeing that the Open University is the distance university of the Netherlands. Uh, I'm currently the president-elect of the Society for Learning and Research, and I'm the program co-chair, chair, or I was the program co-chair for LAC20, and I'll also be a program co-chair for the LAC21 conference next year. Yeah, and uh, so first, just a bit the outline of the talk. 
Um, so we're going to first give a brief description of what is learning analytics and live conference to just have a bit of a context of uh, what we were uh, doing and then explain all of the planning that we had to do around COVID-19 crisis and with the main challenge that we faced moving the conference online. Then we're going to describe a bit on the restructuring that we did to a conference program and some details on the technical infrastructure, how to do the web video conferencing, uh, conference website and, and so on and about communication, uh, the whole logistic plan. And at the end, we're gonna go over some of the areas for improvement and some lessons learned and uh, our impressions of running an online conference and some key takeaways. So first thing, what are learning analytics? And learning analytics is in, in nutshell, a field focused on using digital educational data for understanding and improving learning. So we use all kinds of digital data from students to help them learn better and also to understand uh, how students learn. Uh, if you wanna know more, there is this nice video, very short two, two minutes uh, video uh, by one of our colleagues, Yishan Sai from the University of Edinburgh. Uh, she, it's a nice and short intro to learning analytics. Uh, and this is a more formal definition. So it, it includes all kinds of uh, phases of analysis from measurement, collection, reporting of data about students and with these two goals, understand and improve. Now, what is lack? Yeah, so the question, what is lack? What is this uh, event that we're actually talking about? LAC is the International Conference on Learning Analytics and Knowledge. So LAC, L-A-K. And it's an annual conference and has been taking place since uh, the year 2011. The proceedings of LAC conferences are always published by ACM. And um, in the meantime, it has risen to the top ranked conferences in educational technology as per the Google Scholar rankings. Um, the conference is organized by the Society of Learning Analytics Research, SOLAR. Um, you have the link here for the SOLAR website. And this year, so the LAC20 conference um, was the 10th anniversary of the conference, and it was supposed to take place in Frankfurt in Germany from March 23rd till 27th. And the numbers have been growing every year for the conference. And this year we had expected over 500 attendees. And you can see here the banner of the website. So as you see, it was supposed to take place in Frankfurt um, and it was hosted by the DIPF and the Goethe Universität and the Technische Universität Darmstadt. And uh, yeah, unfortunately that was not possible. And uh, on the next slide, we have our fabulous team. So Vita, if you could click, yeah, perfect. So this is the, the, the team that worked really hard together with us as program chairs to get the conferencing going. And uh, we would like to really, really give a big thank you and shout out to those five people. So uh, Christoph Rending, Hendrik Draxler, Grace Lynch, Nina Seidenberg, and Nicole Hoover. Without them, this certainly would not have been possible. So if it had been just Vita and me, no way could we have done the things we did. So a great thank you to those five people as well. Now, originally, um, LAC conferences run over three days. Usually they are in the week that they take place. It's the Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday is the main conference. We have two days of pre-conference events. That's usually the Monday and the Tuesday where we have workshops and also um, the doctoral consortium. Um, this year we had 50 full research papers accepted, 30 short research papers accepted, and 12 practitioner reports. And usually um, those different kind of um, submissions get different time slots to present. Um, we also had two invited papers from some sister conferences and, oh, sorry. <laughs> and um, we had some, uh, we had keynotes as well. Yeah, sorry. And so the original plan was to have um, uh, some parallel tracks. So as you can see, spread out over the three days we had um, up to four or even five parallel tracks going. The papers were all organized by theme so that within one session, we would have nice um, topics um, within these, uh, within these um, yeah, with nice coherent themes. We also had a poster and demo track planned and um, uh, yeah, we had lots of plans going on for the face-to-face -face meeting. We had some uh, networking sessions, we had poster demo sessions, we had a reception, we had a really nice dinner planned, but alas, this all, um, yeah, kind of had to go to waste, basically. 
Yeah, and all you aware what happened, and I've probably all seen this picture a million times in the last two months, and we're all sick of it anymore. And uh, yeah, I mean, this when this thing uh, happened, uh, really, we were for 10 months. Uh, mostly the other five people that we mentioned were planning on running the conference for normal face-to-face -face conference like every year. And then in January, February, because these things were starting, we were you know, they were mostly trying to do something about it to all kinds of measures. So the first one registered with the Ministry of Health. So if there's something we need to know, they will get the information. Um, different setup for remote presenters. If somebody cannot travel due to, you know, restrictions, whatever, you know, health reasons. Uh, that, and also they are buying all kinds of cleaning products to improve the hygiene and the, you know, cleanliness of the whole space. And yeah, they even, I mean, the team was just amazing. They made their custom like 20 hand sanitizers, which is a really, it's gonna be collector's item in the community uh, very soon. And uh, yeah, and the March came and that was basically a total chaos as the whole world went into chaos. And uh, now in all of this time, society and the uh, organizers of the conference were giving uh, statements weekly statements updating. So that was an important part of the thing, updating people on what are you doing? Uh, so the first statement on February 26th, everything's going per plan. We have the sanitizers, we have all the, you know, we are, we are trying to be prepared. And still there was Germany had maybe 10, 20 cases at the time. March 6th, 60, 70 cases. Yeah, we're going, but you know, we're gonna be doing virtual presentations as well. And a week later, nope, everything's blown away. US abandoned travel to Europe, Australia abandoned travel anywhere and just, you know what happened. And so then we will face the situation, what do you do with 90 presentations and 500 people in 10 days? Really, that was the, that was the, the problem. And then we first think as, you know, we're all researchers, you know what you do in those situations, you go online and see how other people did it before you. And really most online conferences, even though they're online, they're focused on specific region. So conference, I don't know, uh, teaching and learning in UK or African society for something, they're all still kind of locked down to a specific uh, region of the world, pun intended by the way. Uh, they're typically one day events as well. So if there is a corporate programming event in San Francisco, it's gonna be a one day event, few hour event. Uh, typically it's cost saving, I would say, uh, people who don't have typical travel funds and, you know, people who just want to be cool doing something new, which is cool, uh, that's okay. And another thing that's important, most organizers are also presenters. So presenters are experienced, they know how the platform works really well. So you have, a, I don't know, a certain, uh, uh, you know, software developer organization and they're running event on their cool framework for JavaScript, they all are organizers and presenters. So that's a one important thing. And they're all experienced. A lack is a different and most academic conference. First of all, it's a global thing. Uh, people are from all over the world. The time zones are a big issue. It's a longer event. It's three day of a main event. And I mean, it's a practically a five day event. And the problem really, I think the biggest problem is presenters are invited presenters, if you want. Somebody who comes as, as a guest to present. So they are not experienced. They also don't read your emails and so on. You know, they, they don't have experience. They're not organized themselves. So that's really an important thing. So, and then we have, you know, a list of challenges really. How to make it available to everyone in the world. How to make sure that people even show up. I mean, that's, that's an important thing because, you know, it's an online event. Uh, what to do if the, you know, you know, Zoom, you know, blows away. Uh, how to arrange presentations in time, what time zones, how, how to do those things. Uh, do we have sessions at all? I mean, if it's an online event, how about we totally imagine something completely different without sessions? It will be a week of random talks around, you know, around the clock, uh, you know, what times and so on. Uh, how to communicate between ourselves, uh, where to post stuff, uh, how to support social interaction. That's the main part of conferences. You go there to socialize, right? And uh... yeah, so basically one, rule number one that we had to follow in order to get this whole thing going in about 10 days was improvise, adapt, overcome. Um, don't try to be perfect, uh, improvise where you can, adapt to the circumstances that you're given 
and overcome the fear or the being, oh my God, shocked in, in the headlights and not moving at all. Just keep going and do something. That was our rule number one that we followed all the time in anything that we did afterwards. So the conference had to be restructured. Of course, we had to find some sort of like minimum viable product because we couldn't make the perfect online conference. We only had 10 days to do it basically. And um, here are some of the rough things. First of all, it's not gonna happen face-to-face. -face. It had to be moved to cyberspace. And we also announced this on the website. Then the second thing we did is um, we decided to keep the same days. At the beginning, we also thought, hmm, we could move the whole online event later in the year, then we would have more time to prepare, et cetera. However, we thought, well, most people have this specific week reserve. They were planning to come to Frankfurt and they were planning to attend the conference anyway. So why not keep those days? They have nothing else scheduled in that time. They'll be at home due to the, due to the, um, the virus anyway. So postponing, face-to-face -face or even postponing online was too, yeah, too risky for us. Um, what we did do though, is that we did cancel all the workshops and tutorials. So as I explained earlier, originally the plan was that Monday and Tuesday are the two workshop days, but that would have been just logistically way too much to organize with so many different people, so many different groups of organizers. So what we did is we canceled the workshops. Um, we fully refunded all workshop registrations to people. And we told the workshop organizers, you, you're free to run your workshop online on your own or not. You can, can you cannot run it, you can run it, you can half run it, you can run parts of it, all of it, whatever you want. There's no fee for it, do whatever you want to do with it. And the doctoral consortium was organized as a one day full event independently of the main conference. So the doctoral consortium chairs took this upon themselves and organized that on their own. Um, what we did for the main conference program is that uh, we refunded 50% of the registration fee to people and that we at the same time um, offered to people to now newly register specifically only for the online event at the new 50% rate. Um, unfortunately, going fully online and not face-to-face -face meant that we lost one of our keynoters, um, but nothing could be done about that, but we were able to keep the other two. Now about posters and demos, we also kept those. We couldn't run um, a poster and demo reception as we had originally planned, but we, what we did do is we asked all the poster and um, demo presenters to provide a PDF about their submission and to also provide a video about their um, submission in advance of the actual conference. And then we then uploaded those to the website and Vita will explain a little bit about this later on. Um, and so that we could keep the demo voting and the poster voting. Yeah, so the first thing when in a new program structure, so that's how we, I mean, we are program chairs. We were involved in basically designing the program, not running the conference. That was never our, our job. And, uh, you know, the problem, the program we are just, our goal is to get the papers reviewed and all of that, but now this, it, to make the sessions. But now how the day is gonna look like, what sessions, how many sessions and so on. Uh, so the first thing we did uh, was, lengthen the conference day. If you want to run it uh, worldwide, you can't run it in Frankfurt from nine to four, because if you look at the time zones here, that's basically uh, completely not, uh, not, not working for West Coast US, also not really working for um, Australia either, or, or Tokyo and so on. So we decided to extend it a bit. And we also look at the audience, who are the main registrants. Turns out, because it was run in Europe, originally the most people who registered from Europe. Uh, interestingly, Americas and Australia, Australasia were kind of evenly split. There were many people from Australia and also many people from Japan, Korea, China. So there was, a, there was almost like an even split. And um, so the other thing was this, we decided, okay, if this is how we're gonna do it, many people will miss important talks they would like to see, but we're gonna upload immediately, right away, upload immediately, and you know, when they wake up, they will be able to, to watch basically. That, that was the best we can do. Uh, we also kept the sessions. So we're thinking, should we have sessions or not? Or every paper, because now you, know, you can do whatever you want. You don't have rooms to book. Uh, we still kept sessions to be familiar things, something that academics are used to. Uh, but instead of running by topics, they were by time. Really, they were just by time and the presenter time zones. And the really, really lucky situation was that we had our submission forms for papers had 
a tick box saying who's going to be presenting the paper. That was done for completely different reasons, because when you are at a conference the day before, you want to email presenters, tell them, hey, show up 15 minutes earlier to meet with us to test your USB or, you know, cables for laptop and stuff like that. But we had that information, who's going to present. So we used that and looked up where the presenter from what university, University of Arizona, okay, put him in, you know, mountain time, you know, time zone and so on. Uh, so we also kept dedicated session chairs, people who are going to facilitate sessions. Uh, we don't want to look as a conference run by two or five technical people. So that's why it, it gives really more formal look and lo again, looks more like a normal on, uh, academic conference. Also, I asked that, that was uh, something that other people suggested when we were researching, have a pre-recorded backup videos. And we also have this tutorial if you want to, I mean, we're going to share the slides with you and recording, but this is the URL with a Google Doc on how to use Zoom to record the video. Actually, Zoom is quite good uh, to record your own presentation. It's very, very simple. So also to simplify things, we put everything to half an hour. It's really hard to, you know, something that's 20 minutes, something half an hour, it's just so much hard, plus dealing with time zones. Everything is half an hour just to make things simpler. And uh, yeah, so also we had the breaks between sessions, like on a regular conference, if you need to go to the toilet and so on, uh, half an hour as well. So everything was in 30 minutes slot. And an important thing is, not like on a real conference, you just, if somebody doesn't show up, you just move to the next paper, you know, because you notice that the person didn't take his linear with, with name. Here you need to wait. Uh, so the, you know, because many people would just jump for, say, the third paper. They will just come for a specific paper. If you moved it half an hour earlier, that won't work. So you need to really keep the time. And also the important thing that, that we decided to do is to assign people to time slots. So we didn't ask them to pick when they would like to present. We gave them, this is your time slot. Is it working for you or not? And that saved us a lot of time. So if you have more time, you could consider something else for us in 10 days. We don't have time to go five days over email for people to say, you know, are they busy or not? And the important thing is also opening and closing with keynote. We wanted to have a splash of something happening important at the start to have this, you know, beginning of the event and then some closure at the end. And we wanted to have, uh, that's why we started and ended with a keynote. That's not how LAC typically runs, but this was the idea. We also kept the daily schedule as consistent as possible. So every day the sessions were starting at the same time. That just to make time zone conversions easier, really. And we kept this social event thing on the second day, at the end of the second day. And really results, we got 19 people who registered just for this virtual format, which was amazing. We didn't thought anybody would do that, but we got you know, almost you know, 100 people who wouldn't join uh, otherwise. Uh, tech worked almost perfectly, which was really amazing. Uh, another important thing was because now the days were longer, we didn't have four parallel tracks. We only had two tracks because we did, you know, everything is squashed into, into less, less tracks in parallel. And that also meant more people at every paper. So roughly at Slack, I don't know the real numbers, but roughly I would say around 30, 40 people attend on average a paper, paper presentation. Here it was average 50, 60, even some papers had 120 people attending uh, because they were forced really into two sessions. And the uh, and, uh, important thing we did is we are able to make sure that everybody can present. So we assigned their time slots to their time zones in their you know, local time zone. So it was reasonable for everybody. Only four people had pre-recorded talks. Two because they couldn't present and two people because they feared the quality of connection. They were still there for Q&A. So they just wanted to have a smoother presentation and we played the talk for them. And really, unless you enter the minute when the session chair is playing the talk, you wouldn't notice because it still looked like a Zoom talk. And at the end, you still could talk to the presenter, ask Q&A. So it was really almost irrelevant. And um, important impressions from the audience. So these are some feedback numbers. So almost 80% of people said it's either high or very high, the value of the conference for them. And uh, that was really amazing, amazing number. Um, you know, most people were really satisfied. So we have much more detailed numbers, but uh, just a general thing. Uh, another important thing I think you will care more about this is we asked them also, would you participate in the future 
virtual conference. And over 80% people said, yes, they would participate in a virtual conference. I really think this is a really high number. I would definitely not expect over 50%. And this is, this is really great. Yeah, and um, as you can see here, we also got quite some nice feedback from people over Twitter throughout uh, the conference. So um, there's Vita when we were actually just starting with the first keynote, so at the very beginning of the conference, getting ready with some nice beers in Australia, because there it was late in the evening. For us in Europe, it was uh, nine o'clock in the morning. And um, so we had some other things. Similarly, um, as someone else in Australia was settling in then Hendrik cooked us a nice virtual dinner with asparagus. Hendrik was the local chair in Frankfurt, so he cooked us a nice dinner for the um, for the online event, basically. And we had uh, people attending with their children or even with their dogs, uh, congratulating us um, on the 10 years of luck. And then they were getting ready again with some drinks to cheers because we asked everyone to bring a drink to cheers for the social sessions that we had and it's something that we deemed very important also like to, just to get like a little bit of fun feeling in to ask people to share their selfies uh etc um during the conference on twitter and letting us know of how they attend where they attend etc just to get the conversation going and get a little bit that feel of interaction and networking going that you usually have in a conference when you sit next to each other during the lunch or something like that For the technical infrastructure, what we used is um, Zoom, so same as we are using now. And um, yes, there have been some problems or some discussions going on with Zoom, but for us, it was um, the perfect solution at the time. We had been using Zoom anyways um, as from Solar for our webinars and also for our Solar internal meetings, so we had experience with Zoom. We knew how it worked um, more than WebEx or GoToMeetings, etc. Teams often only works um, within institutions or for people who have already some sort of team account. And um, for us, Zoom just offered the best, yeah, the best functionalities. Um, and so with the infrastructure and with the accounts that we did have, we tested the Zoom webinar functionalities extensively and decided of what we wanted to use or not, or extend as extensively as you can do if you have only a few days to basically come up with this conference. Um, some other technical um, tools we used is Slack, and we use this for the background communication um, with the organizing chair. So we had one channel for the organizing team, and we had another channel with the session chair, so that if they ran into any issues while they were chairing session, or also if they had any questions before, afterwards, etc., they could communicate to us um, through these Slack channels. And the third uh, technology that we used is WordPress. So the conference website itself, of course, already existed before because we had the conference planned as usual, face-to-face. -face. But um, what we did do is that we enhanced it a little bit and we'll go into some details of uh, what exactly we did there. So uh, we used the conference website to make the schedule, the new schedule available, to make the Zoom uh, links available, not to everyone though, and we'll come to those details uh, as well, because we of course wanted to avoid Zoom bombings, etc. Um, we had distinct attendee and presenter information on the website, we had discussion boards on the website, um, the voting for the poster and the demos could be done via the website, and also all the recordings of all the sessions after each session were uploaded to the website so that people could re-watch the, um, the recordings, because of course due to the different time zones, someone in the US or someone in Australia might not have been awake at the time that a presentation took place or had to take care of the children or had to do some teaching or had to work otherwise. Um, we were kind of worried whether the WordPress installation actually would sustain all the load, but in the end, everything turned out well and for us, it worked really smoothly. Um, so what exactly did we use for the video conferencing setup? As I said, we used Zoom to do everything. Um, Solar already had a group Zoom account, and um, what we did is that we, as Vita said, we had these two tracks in parallel, and it was always one person responsible for each of the tracks. Um, so Vita had an account, and I had an account. And um, what we did is that we made sure both of us had the same settings in our accounts, and then I logged into both of those um, accounts and created all the sessions. So it was one person 
who created and booked and planned all the sessions in order to really make sure that every session was exactly the same as the other one. And then I always invited the other one. So in Vita's account, I, I basically invited myself as a, as a co-host. And in my account, I invited Vita as a co-host. And we made sure that we, the exact same settings were there. We did not use the Q&A feature for um, the LAC conference, um, just to make things simple, um, because we didn't have time enough to test it at that time. Um, and uh, we did have some practice sessions before to see whether the sound, et cetera, um, would work. Um, what we also did is with the presenters, we invited them as so-called panelists um, in order for them to have a little bit more uh, rights, et cetera. And um, we also uh, emailed them the specific um, links via the Zoom account. So they got an invitation and we asked all of them to arrive a little bit earlier and also to test their video and to test their sound so that we could make, make sure that everything was working smoothly there. Now for the attendees, um, we posted the links to the website, um, hidden for the public and only accessible for the attendees. We'll come to the details about that later. And what we also made sure is that all the normal participants, so anyone who is not presenting, anyone who is just there to listen, was muted upon entry and they could not unmute themselves. And they also could not share their video by themselves. So if they wanted to talk, for example, or wanted to ask a question, they had to raise their hand, basically. There's like a little button they can click uh, within Zoom and then they can raise their hand and then we could allow them to switch on their mic and we could allow them to switch on the camera. So this is basically um, what, we, what we wanted to make sure in order to avoid all these Zoom bombings or people accidentally having their microphone on or to avoid any feedback or if, I don't know, some pet or animal walks in or the kid walks in, whatever. So we wanted to avoid any background noises that could distract from the actual presentation taking place. And for the session chairs, um, we also invited those as panelists and then gave them basically hosting rights once they were in the room. And um, we um, also, so with these hosting rights, they were then also able to give people the mute unmute um, feature. And they were the ones that then actually facilitated the question and answering at the end of each paper presentation. We also asked the session chairs to keep track of the timing so that they could tell the, the presenters that they have five minutes, one minute, zero minutes basically left. Uh, and they were kind of keeping an, uh, keeping an eye on the chat whether any specific questions popped up or if any of the participants was raising their hand in order to ask a question. So this is the rough setup that we used within Zoom uh, using the webinar functionality that is uh, available. So this is not necessarily possible in the normal Zoom rooms, but we use the webinar functionality for this. Um, technical support was basically then done by uh, Vita and myself and sometimes by another colleague of mine, Joana Givet, in those few hours that Vita actually had to go to bed and sleep because it was way too late in Australia. Um, so um, we were making sure that everything was running. We were emailing presenters in case they weren't showing up. Uh, we made sure that uh, all the presentations were being recorded and we kept in contact um, with the rest of the organizational team and the session chairs in the Slack channels that I mentioned earlier. For the video recordings, what we did there is that we stored them to the cloud directly. So in Zoom, you can, um, you can either record locally on your machine, but this one takes up quite some um, power um, just uh, of your machine. Plus, it, the, while it's processing, you cannot, or sometimes you cannot reopen Zoom to start a next session. So we wanted to avoid all of this and just said, okay, we'll store it to the cloud. Um, we had uh, enough cloud space available with the Zoom account that we were using. And uh, we started and stopped at the beginning of each presentation. And then at the end, we did not include the question and answering of the presentations, which in the end turned out to be a mistake. And that is something that we would do differently if we were to do it next time, because there were quite some nice discussion coming up for some of the presentations. So this um, would have been something also nice to have. Once the um, cloud recording URLs were available, so basically once the session finished, all we had the recordings for all the um, separate presentations in, uh, in one session, and we forwarded those links to the local team in Frankfurt, and they were making them then available via the media server on, and then thus on the 
website. What we also did is um, we opened every session 30 minutes earlier. So as Vita explained um, before, every presentation got a 30 minute slot and every session consisted of three presentations. And so basically 30 minutes before the first presentation, we already opened the Zoom, so the, the, the specific Zoom webinar room so that the session chair and the presenters could already go in um, and use the practice mode and test all their um, microphones, test their um, cameras, et cetera, test the screen sharing and everything. And if a presenter didn't show up, as I said, we would email them immediately in, in order to check with them why they weren't there or whether they were having technical problems or maybe they just had to finish the lunch with their kid. I mean, you never know in these times. Um, all the presenters in the end showed up, so we did not have missing presenters, which was really nice. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, now looking at the logistics. So the whole problem was, you know, first thing, uh, create a new program. So once you know, extend the date, have only two tracks instead of four and so on. So uh, we created a new draft program, Aaron created it really. So it typically takes you seven days or 10 days to create a conference program when you wanna put all the papers, similar papers together and everything. No, we put every paper together really in half a day, she, you know, very, very quickly. I remember she did it overnight while I was sleeping uh, just based on the presenter time zones. So basically then you will see very often session with all American US paper presenters then the you know, all of the Europeans. And then later in the day, there were people from Japan, China, Australia, and so on. And then we allocated them a time slot right away. This is your time slot and uh, asked them over email, is it working for you or not? And uh, most of them reply very quickly. Some of them we had to ask like five times until they confirmed. And uh, we also asked them to provide us to, you know, pre provide pre-recorded session if you can, because, you know, who knows what will happen with the uh, with internet connection. And also ask them to sign a consent form to be recorded because you, know, you know, still need to keep track of those minor details, even in the, in, in, in the crisis situation. And then once we finalize the program, really we hold it as a, as a Google spreadsheet. And as soon as the person confirms, we put a you know, green color in the background of the cell. When all of them were confirmed, we, we, we did, you know, this was the final program. And... Uh, then we've booked, you know, who are the session chairs? So we found from the previous session chairs and the people who are known in the field and who are willing to help, uh, we found them and we invited the whole organizing team to Slack and session chairs to Slack. And uh, then Marin created Zoom rooms. Uh, I updated the conference website with all the new programs. So now it's not the old program, now it's a new online program. And then because people have to log into the website. We didn't want to allow people to log, create accounts by themselves to be publicly available because then anybody could create an account. So as soon as the person registers, we would create an account for him on the website. That was done through shell scripts. Uh, that can be automated in a much better way. So uh, I, I got a list of 200 people. I created the you know, automated way of doing that basically. An important part is really providing a book training sessions. So that's something we also got from a colleague saying, yeah, provide people with a training session. Don't think everybody knows how to use Zoom. And then we provided several time zones. We actually had 10 training sessions, five for session chairs, five for presenters. Uh, this was reason that many because we were giving them such a short notice, really two days. So we had to give them more, more, more time slot because more like, you know, it were more likely the people already booked for other meetings and other you know, uh, things. And uh, then we communicated with them and really a single email, that was all that we sent, a single email to, to attendees, presenters and session chairs. To attendees, this is how the tech is gonna work. This is your username and password for the website and other stuff like, uh, for example, the conference provides a link to download ACM proceedings. We provided them as well. Uh, presenters got another email in addition because they're, you know, they're attendees, but they're also presenters. So they got how to join the session. They're joining through email links, not through the conference, uh, because the link on the conference website will put you like here, you all entered as attendees. As a presenter, we cannot figure out out of 200 people in the room who is a presenter because people who have weird names like iPad or iPhone and things like that. So they are coming through email links and they immediately granted bigger permissions to share the screen, audio and so on. And we informed them in that email about the training session, please come to one of those. We just did the same thing for session chairs and uh, 
they you know also they provide great feedback there for example this idea that we should ask people you know track time and you know how you're going to notify a presenter that he's running out of time one of the uh, session chairs said how about we use chat so we ask every uh, every presenter to open pop-up chat on the side so we don't want to you know interrupt saying sorry five more minutes you know that that that's not nice so those kind of things really help us at the end we ran those training session added zoom urls to the website only 24 hours before the conference because we wanted to avoid zoom bombing and all of those things and yeah at the end i mean hope for the best what else uh, that's um, that's how it was uh, in terms of the website so there is there everything was on the website really so it was really wordpress and for attendees wordpress plus uh zoom uh so first required login obviously and once you log in there is a new menu item called attendee corner and everything is there really everything uh so we wanted to have a single place for information and that menu item is blue so the people know that something you know important uh did you have a public schedule where it was without Zoom URLs, but once you log in, the same schedule page will show, if you go to the schedule, you can go now even to the website and you will see, uh, you can see the schedule without Zoom links. Once you log in, the same any item will show the Zoom links. Uh, we also had this, that was a, at the end, final minute idea. What if something completely breaks up? What if Zoom, we need to change the Zoom URL? How are we gonna share that with people? We're not gonna email uh, 500 people, you know, hey, this is a new Zoom link. So we created the one page called InfoBoard, the first one at the top for crisis situation. Luckily, we never had to use it. So that still stays empty. Uh, if say we need to change the Zoom URL, we don't want to post it on Twitter, definitely. But, you know, you know, you all know why. And we also want to have a way of quickly doing that. So the, we decided, how about with this info board for the for the really critical information? Media gallery is the place. So you have then this attendee information, presenter information. That's really the, the almost the same as emails. Then the schedule is again here. Media gallery, that's this media server stuff from University of Frankfurt. All of the recordings are there, plus all the videos and PDFs from posters. Then we have this group chat room. We're going to talk more about them later. Then the, we had LAC mobile app. I mean, this was, we would never do that. Obviously, uh, that was planned for the real LAC uh, in Frankfurt. So the team was really, really trying to do the best thing. And we also had a mobile app. So we said, heck, we're going to keep it here because we already made it and it works good. Enable chatting between people. So you could chat with other attendees one on one. And uh, this was really the list of posters and then the links to vote. And at the end, uh, you know, you can update your profile and so on. And uh, so what are those group room, chat rooms? So basically those are Zoom, two Zoom rooms that were not un unmonitored, not recorded, open 20 hours you know, out of 24. So uh, you can go there. It, we envision them like people popping up there and chatting with random people. Uh, we call them coffee machine and bench in the sun, just two Zoom URLs. You go there and whoever is there, you can chat with them. And um, what we did in those two rooms in order to get this feeling a little bit of networking interaction and what you usually do when you're at the coffee machine at a conference or when you sit uh, in the bench of the sun, we asked people to uh, in specific little break slots that we had in between sessions. So in between every session, we had a 30 minute break. And in, in some of those 30 minute break sessions, we asked um, people, hey, come to the coffee machine or come to the bench in the sun and bring with you. And then, for example, for the first one, we asked everyone to bring a coffee cup, um, which you can see here. Uh, another time we asked people to um, bring, I think the next one, Vita, if you click, is uh, a funny hat, if I remember. No, that was the sunglasses. Yeah, so the sunglasses for the bench in the sun. So we asked people to bring those. Um, we also asked people to bring uh, a funny hat um, to the uh, to the coffee machine again. And then for the last um, fun session, uh, we asked people to bring something typical for their country or for the region that they live in. And um, we did this in order to get a little bit of interaction between the people going and to make them aware that those two rooms are there for them free to use. They were just consistently open. Um, throughout, whenever in parallel to the to the presentation tracks and people could just um, go there. And it was just a little fun um, that we wanted to to give the conference attendees also. Yeah, uh, now for the website. 
So I just want to briefly go over some technical details very, very quickly. This will more as a reference. Once, if you want to do this way, you can, there are many, many ways of doing these things, but if this is the way you want to do it, so just to let you know what we did, we use BB Press and member only plugins. So plugins to implement the discussion boards. Uh, we automated user account. We have those shell scripts. Uh, they will read the CSV for registration system. And then there is this plugin called import users from CSV. You basically can create 50 or 100 accounts using a file. So that was how we were automated uh, the, the process. We use for pro, uh, poster and demo voting something called Poll Maker. There are many plugins. These are the ones we figure out in one day. Uh, not saying that these are the best, these work for us. Uh, we also enabled users to edit their profiles, to put uh, avatars and things like that. So these are the profile builder is a plugin to enable those forms what you know goes into profile information like institution name and your position and stuff like that and this some additional customization i don't uh, we use this wordpress avatar plugin to upload so this is the last item you see avatar upload at the bottom of the menu that's how you would upload your avatar that's shown in the discussion board uh, now we have those to enable just for register people two things user menu plugin and Profile Builder also as well. So this how this if, uh, these are how discussion boards look like. So BB Press, okay, they're not the best, but they're 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 decent. Uh, this is this user many plugin. So a many item attendee corner was only visible to logged in users. You see this part. So this is something that adds to WordPress. If you ever use WordPress, this looks very familiar. How do you make menus? So this will enable us to make something visible only to you know, logged in users. And also at the end of the page in WordPress, if you ever use it, you know, there's a bunch of stuff below. There is this profile builder added that these certain pages is only available for logged in users. So that's how we created this. There are many ways of doing this. Just quickly go over these, how we did it. Uh, now, the important part of our website really was the schedule page. And we really put a lot of effort into making sure this is very easy for people to use. So there are many usability aspects here. For example, every day the sessions were starting at the same time. We had something called morning session. Always it starts at 11 and goes for an hour and a half. Early afternoons are from one and LVD is done for a full hour, 9, 11, 13, 15, 17, 19. The only difference were really the first day. We didn't have early morning session. That was the opening keynote. If you see it here in the program, opening keynote was during this early morning. And uh, we really didn't have these later on Friday. Uh, when we were deciding this, we really didn't know the lockdown will still happen. So we decided how about on Friday, we make it a bit shorter so people can go out somewhere, you know, on, on Friday evening. We really didn't know everybody would stay at home because of the lockdown. Um, another thing important, we showed all of the uh, slot, all of the papers in multiple time zones. So US, Pacific and Eastern, London, Frankfurt, Tokyo, Sydney, and just the people roughly know when something happens. To make sure, because time zone conversions are tricky, everybody can make a mistake, we also made this ICS file, a calendar file, so people can import that to their calendar, their Outlook or Google Calendar, and then they will know exactly at their time when something happens. So this was really, uh, you know, just to make sure that if we don't want presenter to come over later saying, oh, I mistaken central time zone to mountain time zone, something like that. Uh, yeah, so just once, you know, this would be really how the technical part. Now, some things that where we could have done a bit better job. First, easy part. So Q&A recording. Uh, we didn't do that. Uh, we talked, how about maybe sometimes the paper is presentation is done good, but then QA doesn't go well and the people who did don't like that they we recorded that, you know, you know, paper was much better than the QA and decided how about it's safer for attendees to remove that part. And then we regret, but there were so many QAs that really were almost you know important as, as the paper itself. And uh, that in the future we would still record them. So that's very easy to do. We just press stop button, you know, five minutes later. Uh, another thing, use of Q&A chat. So we're using it today uh, here. You can see you can open Q&A or a regular chat. We didn't want to do that. The cool thing about this is especially for keynotes, because in keynotes you have 250 people. 
and uh, people can upload questions. So in a, in a keynote, you don't have enough time to answer you know, 50 questions. Uh, so you want people to upload and then the keynote can answer only top five or something like that. So that's really good. Uh, again, trivial thing to add. Uh, another thing we added it today is this attendee count. So we didn't know, I didn't know about this up to 10 days ago. Uh, we, you, 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 you cannot see the number of people in the room. For example, now there are 275. You cannot set that up in advance. There is only somewhere very buried in settings of, of uh, um, Zoom, there is a tick box saying show attendees, they can, the number of people in the room. And uh, that's really nice. So people have awareness, they're, they're not alone in the room. And uh, the problem is it's, it's, it's usability problem with, with, within Zoom. So uh, that's something again, very simple to, to fix. And really there was, there was this blog post by Ascalite, that's Australian organization on higher education learning. And uh, people wrote a comment. So uh, in a real conference, people can see how many people are, are, are you know, in, in the attendance. And uh, that was something that was missing. In, in this, uh, you're like presenting in a blank room, almost, you, you know, that, that was really uh, a bit of a, um, not the best part. Um, another thing that kind of um, leaves some room for improvements is the actual mingling after talk. So usually after presentation is over, people can stay in the room for a little bit and they can, they can talk um, after the presentations or get in touch with one of the presenters and say, hey, do you have time for a coffee or um, can we talk later or things like that? And we, um, the way we had set it up, um, it didn't really work because we had to close every session, basically really when the session was over in order to start the pre part for the next session coming up so that um, the session chairs and the presenters could test um, their microphones, uh, video, etc. cetera. Um, what would help with this is actually to make this basically instead of giving the session chairs and the presenters half an hour before their session starts, to only give them 15 minutes because in the end that's way more than enough and then this way we could have had 15 minutes at the end of each session so that we kind of don't have to kick people out right away um overlapping zoom sessions is a little bit problematic in in zoom because sometimes um then we would have had to double the rooms or double the moderators double the tech people so now we had just um rita and me or sometimes joanna um doing this so um, this is why that didn't work for us. But if we would have shifted it with this 15 minute, 15 minute, it would have been really nice because that was also a feedback we got um, just to have like 10 minutes or something like that after the last Q&A of a presentation to give the people some way of intermingling and some way of um, finding a possibility of, hey, or like allowing a presenter to say, hey, by the way, I opened a thread about my paper in the discussion forum, please come there things like this, which we had to unfortunately cut off a little bit. Um, uh, yeah, and that, that didn't work too well. Um, some other areas of improvement, and that was really basically the, the, the most difficult is of course, is um, the whole social aspect. So we tried to, to do this via the Twitter, as I mentioned earlier, we tried to do it with these funny sessions at the coffee machine or the bench in the sun. And we also tried to, replace or instead of having the social dinner that is usually there where then also the best paper etc is announced we had um one session on the second day um but of course this is difficult for people to to keep up it had to be somewhat ad hoc and it has to feel spontaneous you have to present um for us in europe it was the evening for the us it was early in the morning for australia it was basically in the middle of the night so it was always really difficult to get this whole social interaction feeling. So what we would suggest in the future, if we had had more time to prepare, is that um, Zoom and possibly also some other um, video platforms, they use, uh, they, they do allow the, the functionality of breakout rooms. So this is something that um, could have been done when you can ask people to just um, say, hey, we set up a, a room here about topic X. Um, maybe also um, have some moderators or some sort of session chairs in those rooms as well and use these, um, these breakout or some similar functionality in order to get the discussion going a bit more. We were fearing that this might confuse people if we offer too many Zoom links and too many things at the same time. Plus we didn't have um, enough time to actually prepare this properly. 
but this is something we would try to improve um, if we had to do it again and that we just to get the social interaction a bit more. And also another thing um, where we definitely would want to improve is the whole poster and demo issue. We did have them there and people could vote. Um, the posters and the demo videos, et cetera, were available via the website, but that was it. We didn't give them any other platform where they didn't have their own session. We didn't have like a demo shootout or like a mini, everyone gets a one minute, one slide kind of presentation. So this is something um, we would like to, we would like to, or would have changed if we had more time or if we had to do it again. This is something to give more room, give more stage to the poster and to the demo presenters um, because they kind of got lost a little bit on the side. And yeah, I mean, once the you know, whole event was over, just we, you know, just want to go over some of the our, you know, advantages and disadvantages of, us, of, of the whole thing. So uh, impressions of running an online conference, clearly less CO2 is used, you know, there are no planes involved and no flight travel and so on. So that's definitely one benefit that, that's getting more and more important in academia when people travel into 10 conferences a year and, and so on. Uh, overall is cheaper. I mean, well, for the counting cost of everybody who need to book a hotel, 500 people booking five day hotel, that, that's a substantial amount of money. So the, you know, the, the price is, is really uh, negligible compared to on, uh, to face to face. So obviously many people have family uh, responsibilities, small children, you know, parents, uh, all and so that there's no need for travel, which is very, very important for many people. Uh, and really a support attendees who would not otherwise attend. So we had some of the people who were very few places where we had to change the program, those, those allocated time slots. And there was one person who didn't uh, intend to, to, to go to lag, his uh, colleague would present. But since it was an online event, he said, actually, I want to present. We made for him a paper in the middle of night. And he said, no, this doesn't work for me. So that was really because, you know, th that was a real change. Uh, another thing, everything is easily recorded. Typically, it involves a lot of, you know, mingling, uh, you know, uh, fiddling with technology uh, to record every live session and so on. Here, that was all recorded very, very easily. Uh, and in general, more less parties are involved. You don't need, if you're organizing, you need to book a hotel, venues, uh, caterings, all of the things. We had to deal with some of those because we were already half, you know, a month away from the conference. So if you're planning something, say six months from now, and you didn't, you know, it, it can be much simpler overall. Uh, there are many, you know, important disadvantages. Uh, t higher technological costs. I mean, conference, setting up Zoom, I don't know exact cost, but I would say around five thousand, four or five thousand dollars at least will cost you for, you know, two tracks. If you want to run four or ten tracks, you can be, you know, 50, you know, you can go up to fifty thousand dollars just to run a, a tech infrastructure. Uh, you also need to be very, very careful in communication. We know from online education, I mean, that's our field. Uh, it's online courses require more preparation because you cannot come to the classroom and fix you know, hey, yeah, I made a wrong mistake. Uh, it's not a chapter two, it's a chapter three. The same thing here, if you send the wrong URL, that's it, it's over. You, you won't be running the session. Whereas in the classroom or in a, in a live session, you can fix those things. So you need to be much more prepared, you know, careful in preparation not to make mistakes. Uh, and you have many presenters. This coordination is really hard. Uh, in the online conference, in a face-to-face -face conference, uh, most, it, it, you know, you're communicating over months to people about their, to send you abstracts, to PDFs and all of that. But once that's done, this very quick and, you know, communication happens face to face. People arrive at the conference and, you know, that, that's how it's done. So it's, it's much easier. Uh, also big challenge is keeping people engaged. You know how in conferences people, half of them are anyways looking at their laptops. Now they are all looking at their laptops because they are, you know, watching over a computer and there is notification from emails and YouTube videos and all of that. So keeping people engaged is harder than, than in a face-to-face. -face. Uh, and really the big, big problem, a lack of networking opportunities. How would you do serendipitous, you know, uh, uh, communication? Some ideas to use breakout rooms, maybe make uh, breakout rooms of 10, which would be like something like a round table <clears throat> where, people will have to report back what they discussed about. Or you make uh, breakout rooms with two people for every breakout room. That will be something similar, like talk to the person sitting next to you and discuss you know, this and that. So those things, or maybe one idea, 
everybody would rename themselves, put the name of, you know, uh, in, into their username, uh, the topic. So you will assign the people based on the topics uh, to the breakout rooms. And the uh, also important thing is how would you run a really long hands-on activities? So often people have a problem on running something like, uh, you know, um, tutorial for eight hours, for six hour tutorial, that's very hard. And there's this association called uh, ALT, Association for Learning and Teaching, uh, they have run on, they're running online conferences for years and they really have several types of activities, webinars like we do, they have tweet chats, which are basically discussion on Twitter and they do those collaborative edits of documents like, you know, creating open educational resources and stuff like that. But uh, how would you do a, our, you know, our tutorial online? That's, that's a really tricky. But at the end, I mean, we got feedback like this saying, I really hope it will be virtual next year. I don't want to fly to California, but uh, location of the next year, like 21. Uh, but if it's virtual, I would attend. I enjoyed it very much. So, you know, um, yeah, I mean, some people really enjoyed the, the fact that it was virtual, some that, uh, you know, they didn't, obviously, because of the lack of social things. So some key takeaways. Uh, Make sure to have good technical team plan in advance, you know, as long as you can. Uh, know your presenter and audience, tech check where they're from to make sure the time zones will work for everybody. Uh, so, you know, enable them to participate. Time zones are really your biggest enemy and, you know, you need to treat them with care. So either provide calendars or multiple time zones on the websites or in the local time zone, if possible, if you can program the website to show only the local time zone, whatever. Uh, explore the functionality of the platform you use. We didn't want to use any other that we didn't know. We used Zoom because we were most comfortable with it. Uh, provide training opportunities for people. Most of them didn't use stuff before, uh, or they have a laptop. They never use Zoom because uh, they use WebEx at their institution and things like that. Uh, be clear with your communication. People anyways don't read long emails, and now you're sending them long emails, you know, and they don't read and they will email, hey, where is the link to join the session? I cannot find it. You need to be very clear with those things. Uh, plan for emergency situations. What are you gonna do if the tech fails? You need to have those places to post information very, very quickly. Uh, you know, provide pre-recorded talks, uh, channels to communicate with others, or, or, you know, for example, I had the open tethering connection all the time, and if my internet breaks, I will, I will switch immediately to a mobile connection to, to, to log in again and so on. Uh, find ways to engage the audience. That's something we could have done a bit of better job, but that's, uh, that's tricky, very really tricky thing to do. With those breakout rooms, something mingling up the talks, as Mary mentioned, uh, those hallway places where we did, and uh, yeah, that's some things that, you know, require a, a bit more time to think about. And uh, we use online discussion on Twitter, obviously those are very, very useful. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. So we're gonna open the floor for a few questions. We are a bit over time, but I hope this will be, uh, you know, we can um, answer some of the questions. So I, I see a couple of already asked. Um, uh, how do you manage talkers, people who are over the over the time? Uh, we are very strict with that, and we, you know we will cut them off. I mean that's up to session chair. That's why we like session chairs to be somebody who is experienced with doing stuff like that. So uh, you know you don't want to put a, a first year under a PhD student who would be really uncomfortable with situation like that. Um, social parts were really just the regular Zoom sessions. Uh, we were just having uh, you know all kinds of announcements and things like that. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, we were hosting technologically. Um, yeah, we're going to answer some of those questions. We're going to send you answers to those questions as well over email. And yeah, I, was just uh, say, I don't think we can answer every. I yeah, mean, also in the in the general chat, there were quite some questions. Yeah, there. we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna write that and answer that uh, sent to everybody, and the recording of the session will be available online as well. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, what what else to say? I mean, this was uh, yeah, so hopefully so we'll one, give you some one, idea. One one question here is that where did you upload the talk videos? So at the moment they are uh, on the website, but only available to those that registered for the conference. And 90 days after the conference, we will put them on YouTube. So if you wait a few more weeks, you can also take a look at the at all the presentations uh, so for any author or any presenter that gave us uh, the allowance and that signed the consent form that um, 
they are okay with us sharing the presentation on the Solar YouTube channel, those presentations will be available on the channel um, in a few weeks. So right now they're only available for the registered conferences, uh, for the registered participants of the conference. Um, similar, we did this with the companion proceedings, for example, for the conference. So um, any research paper is published in the ACM proceedings and they are published by ACM and everyone registered um, got a version of those proceedings. At the moment, ACM has uh, opened up their, um, their website anyway, so anyone can take a look at the proceedings. For the companion proceedings, um, it's the same registered participants have access already now. And 90 days after the conference, we will make them available on the SOLAR website. So um, you can all take a look. So the companion proceedings contain um, the workshops, the poster papers, the uh, demo papers, um, some other workshop submissions. Um, so if, if a workshop had their own call for papers and the um, practitioner paper. So um, all this will be available um, in a few weeks to anyone openly. Yeah. I've seen one question asking, what about 20 parallel sessions? In principle, you could do it. You will just need 20 people to run, one to run each session and 20 accounts for Zoom. It will cost you hell of a money, but it's doable. And technically it's doable. It will just be a lot of, you know, a lot of preparation. So definitely something to do in 10 days, that will be very, very hard, but doable even, I mean, this approach I think can scale. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for, for attending. And um, yeah, we're gonna post, I mean, there are a lot of questions here and we're gonna post, definitely send you the PDF with all of the, the, the responses and also the recording of the video and slides. And uh, yeah, good luck with your own conferences. What else to tell you? Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining. Thank and you. Thanks for the questions as well. And good luck with your online conferences. Bye. Bye bye, everyone.